Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm ACC Atarush Jain, a proud Fintrammer and your faculty for UK Tax. Welcome to session two of UK Tax, where we learn about the income tax computation. But before that, we'll revise session one. So without further ado, let's dive in. In session one, we learned about the basics of the UK tax system, which will help you set a foundation for the entire subject matter. And we learned about how the main purpose behind taxation is for to influence economic outcomes and for redistribution of wealth, that is social justice. There are two types of taxation, direct and indirect tax. We did an illustration on this as well. We learned that the admin HMRC administers the UK tax system. We learned about the overall structure of the tax administration system. And we learned the three main sources of UK tax law, that is HMRC guidance, statute and case law. We also learned the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. It's a very important topic that you must remember at all times, so and which you will be tested in the exam. So keep this in mind. We learned about double taxation relief and how companies speak to each other through double taxation agreements in the context of the UK. We learned about ACCA code of ethics and conduct, which I'm sure by now all of you are imbibing in your personal and professional lives. So keep this in your mind and in your hearts all the time. So what are some of the basic principles of income tax computation? The basis of assessment. Individuals in the UK are assessed to tax on their income arising in a tax year. Now what is a tax year? Tax year in the UK starts from 6th April and ends on 5th April. So for the exam in consideration, we are taking the tax year FY FY 23, which started on 6th April 22 and ended on 5th April 23. This will remain common across the syllabus, guys. So please be aware that you understand that and take in the concept completely. The tax year FY 23 starts on 6th April 2022 and ended on 5th April 2023. Personal allowance. Now, personal allowance is tax-free income that is given to individuals in the UK every year. That is, it is renewed every year and it is it's a tax-free income that is given to individual residents every year. This re reduces their overall tax liability and it's a benefit given by the government for individuals to save tax and encourage savings. The PA for the current year is 12,570. We will also learn how personal allowance is deducted for high income individuals. But we must remember that personal allowance is a tax free income available to all UK residents for every tax year. Accessible persons. All individuals in the UK, including the children, are accessible or chargeable to tax. Tax residency determines how, whether they are taxed or not. And remember, we will learn more about this tax residence later in the session. But remember, all UK tax residents are assessed to tax on their global income. So if you are a UK tax resident and you are in earning income across the world, it, you will be taxed on all of that, of course, with due regard to the double taxation agreements. Spouses within a married couple are treated as separate individuals. So husband and wife are treated as separate individuals in the UK. Civil partners are also treated the same way as spouses. Civil partners are an institute to encourage same sex couples in the UK. And it will be treated in the same way as spouses. Now, what is to learn from here? Any income generated from a jointly owned asset by of spouses is split 50-50 ratio unless an election is made on the contrary. For instance, if, an in, if a, a couple like a spouse, spouses or civil partners 
own a property and earn income of say 10,000 pounds from that property, that will be split 50-50 between the spouses or civil partners unless they make an election. So, what election can they make? They can make 60-40 or 70-30 or whatever the case may be, whatever percentage they may choose. But unless they have made that election in the tax return, they will be charged to on 50-50. So, this is the thing that we have to remember. In case an election of splitting the income from a jointly owned asset is not made in the tax return, the income will be divided 50-50 between the two spouses or civil partners for a jointly owned asset. So, guys, this is a very important topic. It will be tested in, in the form of, a, of an MCQ which will ask you to apply the concept and not just in a theory form, it will ask you to apply the concept. So it's important you learn the concept and understand the concept well. One further thing, children under the age of 18 are also taxable persons. But in most cases, you will notice that children usually earn income that is less than the personal allowance, that is PA. So their income is usually not taxable. Now moving to taxable income. It's very, very important to understand the basic proforma of a tax computation, guys. It's very, very important because each source of income is computed differently. Each source of income is taxed differently at different tax rates. It has different thresholds. So it's important that you know how to consolidate it in one place. And we'll learn more about that today. We remember that any exempt income is also excluded and the examiner wants that it should note it to be exempt in the computation. So for instance, if there is an exempt income in the computation, there it will be noticed as, ex as exempt by mentioning zero against that. So if there, there is an exempt income, the amount will that be zero so that the examiner knows that you know that it is in fact an exempt income. It's very important that for large scale questions, you, you do uh, remember to put zero against exempt. Guys, so let's talk about the income tax computation. Again, guys, this is very, very important because 15, uh, a 115 marker question in the exam will be based on computing income tax for individuals. And it's important that you learn this computation. We will come to detailed illustrations on with everything in detail in the later in sessions. But it's important you understand the basics and the basic structure of a computation before we dive in. This is a very, very important chapter. So please be careful. There are mainly three sources of income that an individual can earn, right? That's non-savings income, savings income, and dividend income. Now, non-savings income can be of various types. First type is trading income that an individual can earn from a self-employed business or a self-employed profession and so on. <clears throat> Employment income is what you earn from a salary or wages or bonuses that you may earn from an employer is all co computed under employment income. Property income, as we just discussed, can be rental income or lease income from a property and it's all will be computed under property income. <coughs> Pension income is what an individual after retirement can earn through either a government scheme or a, prof or a company scheme or any other scheme. And all of the income earned as pension that they receive from different schemes will come under pension income. Again, guys, we'll learn about all of these things in detail. But remember, there are four kinds of non-savings income, which are trading, employment, pension, and property. Again, we'll learn about each of these in details, but there are four types of income under non-savings income, which will be clubbed together in the, in the overall computation of an individual. Coming to savings income, we have two kinds of savings income, bank interest, that is basically interest received on fixed deposits or any other investments you have in the bank. Building society interest, building societies are those societies in the UK which pool funds from investors and invest in real estate assets. And income generated from those assets are then sent back to the investors and taxed on the investors under the head of savings income. So remember that. <coughs> Dividend income is of course income received as dividends from UK companies. 
So it's important that any income received from any income received or dividends from UK companies is taxed under dividend. Now we will, in the computation, we will compute all three that is non savings income plus savings income plus dividend income and add all three to get total income. This is the total income that an individual will earn in a tax year. From this total income, we'll deduct any reliefs that an individual is eligible for. These reliefs may include qual on qualifying interest payments on certain loss reliefs, which we'll learn about in great, great detail throughout the chapter, throughout the curriculum. But to get, but we'll deduct the reliefs from total income to get net income. Net income will be used to finally we'll deduct personal allowance from net income personal allowance of 12,570 will be deducted from net income to get the taxable income remember taxable income is what will on which the individual will ultimately pay tax so guys I hope you understood everything in this computation let's go through it once more there are three sources of income, non-savings, savings and dividend. Each of them have subheadings which will be computed together and to get the final total income for the tax year, we'll deduct relief from there to get net income and deduct personal allowance finally from net income to get the total taxable income. Remember, personal allowance is deducted at last. So remember that personal allowance will be done after you've computed everything else. So remember that about personal allowance. On exempt income, there are mainly three kinds of exempt income. And as I, as I said, it will have to be noted as exempt in the exam question. Exempt income includes interest from national savings and investment certificates, uh, betting, lottery, and premium bond winnings, and income received from individual savings accounts. Now, individual savings account is a very common scheme available to UK residents because any income earned through ISAs, will that be uh, income, general income or capital gains income, it is tax free. So individual savings accounts is something that is used a, a lot by the UK tax residents and it's important it's noted as exempt in the exam. Right, coming to personal allowance. Now personal allowance, as I said guys, very important chapter, it's important that you understand this, it's it will be part of every income tax computation that you do. Every income tax computation will have a component for personal allowance and it's important you understand that. It's, we just learned that it's a tax free income that every individual is entitled to each tax year. It gets renewed every tax year and <clears throat> it's called and it's given to the point of 12,570 pounds. So for the exam, PA, remember guys, I'll be using PA for personal allowance from now on. So please keep that in mind all the time. PA must always be deducted from the taxpayer's net income in the following order. Remember, go back to the computation. PA will first be deducted from non-savings income, then from savings income, then from dividend income. We'll learn, we'll go through illustrations on how to do that and how it will what will be the effect of each of these things. But remember that personal allowance for now is, is deducted in the following order, non-savings, savings and dividend. Guys, this is very important because as I said, every source of income is computed differently, is taxed differently, has different thresholds. So it's important that we follow the procedure that has been laid out in the statute books. Surplus PA is lost and cannot be carried to following years. What does this mean? So in case if a taxpayer has income that is less than the personal allowance, suppose he has income of 11,000 in a tax year, but his obviously the tax, the personal allowance available is 12,570. So this excess of 1,570 will be lost. It will not be carried to the next year and it will be lost. So this is something that you have to remember a surplus PA is lost forever. Personal PA cannot be set against capital gains. It will only be set against income in the following order that is non-saving savings and dividend, but it will never be against capital gains. So remember that it might be asked as a theory question uh, in the MCQ uh, section. So it's important that you remember these little facts to ensure that nothing is left uncovered in the subject. 
Under certain cases, which we learn about, a part of the PA can be transferred to spouse or a civil partner. Right, guys, so remember that you don't have to worry about remembering the numbers or the thresholds or the tax rates for each or for any of these things. This will be provided to you in the tax rates and allowances sheet provided to you in the examination. Everything from tax rates, from thresholds, to the, the, to the limits for personal allowance, for instance, will also be available to you in the exam itself. All you have to focus on is understanding the concepts and doing enough questions, practicing enough questions so that you can clear the exam in one go. So you don't have to worry about the PA tax rate, the PA tax rate, the PA threshold of 12,570 pounds will be given to you in the exam. Now, as we learned, PA is reduced for high income individuals above 100,000 pounds. This is done by the HMRC to ensure that high income taxpayers do not get too many deductions so that more tax can be taken from high income individuals and that can benefit the society. Now, how, how is this reduction affected in a, in a tax computation? Reduction of PA for high income individuals is based on the, uh, that taxpayer's adjusted net income. What is adjusted net income? Adjusted net income is net income. Remember, net income is before personal allowance but after reliefs. Go back to the computation is taxable income, it's total income minus reliefs is net income gives you net gives you net income and if there's if we realize that this net income is more than 100000 we'll calculate adjusted net income how is this adjusted what how do we calculate adjusted net income we'll deduct gross gift aid donations these are donations made to charities or to ngos for social causes we'll learn more about this in detail in just a minute but we'll deduct gross gift aid donations and we'll discuss we'll deduct gross personal pension contributions so any contributions made by an individual for personal pension schemes is also deducted to calculate adjusted net income so in case if we after deducting these two items we'll get adjusted income and if this adjusted income is more than 100000 if this adjusted income guys remember it's more than 100000 the pa is reduced by 50% of that access over 100,000. So if the adjusted income is say 110,000, it is that and the limit is 100,000, the access of adjusted net income over the limit is 10,000, 50% of that, that is 5,000 pounds will be deducted from the taxpayer's personal allowance. So 5,000 will be deducted, the total tax allowance is for, uh, total personal allowance is 12,570 and if 5,000 and deducted, the only the total personal allowance that will be given to the taxpayer is 7,570. So remember that per, for individuals earning above 100,000 pounds, the excess of their income over 100,000 pounds, half of that will be reduced from the personal allowance. So using this principle, we obviously know that in case an adjusted net income is more than 125,140 pounds, it will not be entitled to any PA since the access will override is, is twice the PA. So it will not be available if the income is more than 125,140. So if you know the figure, it will make your computation easier and it will make your calculation easier. You won't have to do the benefit of calc do the whole thing of calculating the thing. The, 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 the computation in every aspect of the computation, you can just make sure that you, you simply do not deduct personal allowance because that is not available. Let's do a quick illustration on this. Now, Emma received trading income of 100,000, 110,000 in the tax year, similar to what we just learned. And they made gift donations of 4,000 pounds. What would be uh, Emma's taxable income? Now, trading income is 110,000. It's more than 110,000. So we'll calculate what is the adjusted net income. Remember guys, the principle here is that we'll compute, we'll ask, we'll do what the question has asked first. 
the question has asked us to compute MS taxable income. So we'll compute that taxable income first and any workings that we have to do to get there, we'll do it in workings. So workings will always come after the question. So it's important to remember that. So MS trading income is 110,000. We know that this is more than 100,000. So we'll have to calculate adjusted net income. Adjusted net income is 106,000 since, since she had gross gift do gifted donations of 4,000. This is 6,000 more than the limit of 100,000. And so half of 6,000 is 3,000, which will be deducted from the personal allowance available. 3,000 is deducted from personal allowance available of 12,570. That will give you an adjusted PA of 9,570. So only 9,570 will be available for deductions to Emma. The adjusted PA will then be deducted from the trading income, giving taxable income of 100,430. I hope you guys understood. And this is how the basic principle of how personal allowance is computed, right? Coming to the second stage, which is the income tax liability. Now, after we have computed the taxable income, the next step is of course to pay the taxes on that income. And this is called income tax liability. As I learned, as I said before, different rates of tax apply on different sources of income. You don't have to remember these tax uh, rates. They will be given to you in the exam, but just so that we know, so that we cover the basics in this chapter, non-savings income will be covered, will be taxed at 20, 40 and 45 percent. Savings income will, uh, will have a zero nil rate as well. We'll learn about this in future sessions, but they will be taxed at a nil rate, so some part of it, and they'll, uh, and more of that, and, and after that will be taxed on 20, 40 and 45 percent. Dividend income, on the other hand, will have a nil rate as well, but they will be taxed on 7.5, 32.5, and 38.8 percent, depending on different income thresholds. We'll learn about more of, on these thresholds when we get to the specific chapters and the specific, specific sessions. But for now, remember that this is how rates are for all three sources of income. Tax rates for non-savings income are this basic rate band of first 37,700 of taxable income will be taxed at 47 between 37,701 to 150,000 will be taxed at 40 percent which is the higher rate band and excess of 150,000 pounds will be taxed at 45 percent. So these are the three rate bands 20, 40 and 45 percent. Guys this this will be available to you in the exam so you don't have to remember and memorize the thresholds but remember to classify them correctly. Remember, start using these terms in your preparations and in your conversations with your peers on basic rate band, higher rate band, additional rate bands. These are terms that you have to start bringing in in your daily conversations so that the concepts are registered with you. So there are three th thresholds for non-savings income. And remember guys, income tax liability again is calculated in the strict order non-savings first, sa savings second and dividend income. Remember we learned that personal allowance is deducted in the same order. So an income tax liability will be calculated in the same order as well. So it's important that we learn how to do that and the details of this in later sessions but it's important that you understand the basic principle that income tax liability is calculated in a strict order starting from non-savings income to savings income and finally dividend income. What are the principles of income tax computation? Let's just revise it. We'll calculate the individual's net income using the computation. We'll consider the reduction of the PA if the ANI exceeds 100,000. We just did an illustration on that. We'll deduct the appropriate amount of PA to calculate the final taxable income. And we'll calculate the income tax liability bearing in mind the different thresholds. So keeping these principles in mind, let's do a few illustrations. Bashir has taxable trading income of 21,165 pounds and employment income of 3,000 in the tax year. He has no savings or dividend income. So he has non-savings income of two types, that is taxable trading income and employment income and he has no savings or dividend income, what will be the income tax liability for the tax year? 
we calculate, we total the uh, sources of income, trading, employment, we get total income. Total income is equal to net income because there are no reliefs, so it will be equal to net income. We'll divide, since this he is not earning more than 100,000 pounds, we'll de uh, deduct the full PA of 12,570 pounds and taxable income is charged at 11,595. This is farm part of the basic rate income that is from the on the first uh, 37,700 pounds is taxed at 20%. So this 11,595 of taxable is taxed at 20%, which gives us two two three one nine pounds. I hope you understood. Let's move to the next illustration. Mala has taxable trading income of 43,765 pounds and employment income of 7,000, no savings or dividend. Again, only two sources of non-savings income. We'll add those two. Total income is the same as net income, which gives us 50,765. We'll deduct full PA because it's less than 100,000. We get taxable income of 38,195. Remember, the first 37,700 will be taxed at 20%, that is 740, and the remaining 495 will be taxed at 40%. So the total tax rate will be, total tax liability will be 7,738. Coming to illustration 4, Tim has taxable trading income of 135,000 and employment income of 33,680 pounds, and he does not have any savings or dividend income. What is the calculation. Let's do a quickly trading and employment income, two sources of non savings income, calculated total income, adjusted PA is zero because remember this income is more than 125,140 and there will, no, there will be no reductions on this because we have not been told of any gross gift aid donations or personal pension contribution. So total income or net income is the same as adjusted net income and adjust, if adjusted net income is more than 125.40, the PA is nil. Therefore, the entire taxable income, the entire income of uh, 168680 pounds will be treated as taxable income. And we'll apply the thresholds here. First 37,700 at 20% till 150,000, 150,000 minus 37,700 is 112,300 into 40% and the remaining that is 168,680 minus 150,000 will give us 18,680 into 45% and the total income tax liability is 60,866 pounds. So guys, I hope you understood this. We did three illustrations learning how to apply the different thresholds. Of course, from now here on, it's going to get a little more complex, a little more exciting, but we'll learn more with the, by doing more illustrations and understanding going deeper into each aspect of the tax law. So keep the seat belts on and keep the spirits high and don't worry about anything. We'll do everything together. There are a few tax planning items which I want you to read and we'll cover it in any doubt sessions that we that we will do over the weekends or over or separately. Coming to marriage allowance. As I said, there is a possibility that personal allowance can be shifted from one partner to another. Marriage allowance is how we do it. Marriage allowance allows a spouse or civil partner to transfer a fixed amount of personal allowance to his or her civil partner. Now, of how does it, this is only available if neither of the spouses or the partner are higher rate or additional taxpayer. That is this benefit of transferring allowances is only available to basic tax rate payers. That is both the uh, partners or spouses need to have income less than 37,700. Only then will this uh, benefit be available to them. An election for the MA allows the transfer to the other amount of a fixed amount of PA. That is 10% of the personal allowance, that is 1260, that is 10% of, 
that is 10 percent of 12,570, 1260 is allowed to be transferred from one partner to the other. You can't transfer more or less than this, it can only transfer this amount, not more than this, not less than this, only this amount. And the effect of the transfer is that the transferring spouse PA, that is the one who transfers the PA, their PA is deducted by the 1260 and who receives the PA, that is who is the recipient of the transfer, his income tax liability is reduced by a maximum of 252. Why 252? Because it is the tax saved on the additional personal allowance given to him will be 20% because they are basic rate taxpayers. They will sp uh, save taxes of 20% at, at 1260. So instead of giving it, instead of enhancing their personal allowance, the maximum of 252 is deducted from their tax liability. And if the recipient's income tax liability is less than 252, that is a repayment is not possible and the maximum it can do is to reduce the income to zero. Now this election to do this, we'll, we'll just do an illustration in a minute, but you have to understand the administrative aspects of it as well. To be effective for this tax year, the election can be made in advance by 5th April. That is before the year starts, the taxpayers can make this election and they can also make this election within four years of the end of the tax year. So in case they forget to do it in advance, they can do it up to four years after the end of the tax year. So that is in case of FY23, they can do it till 5th April 2028. That is four years after the end of this tax year, they can make this election. Again, you don't have to worry about the thresholds or the tax figures. This transfer amount of PA of 1260 will be provided to you in the examination. Let's do a quick illustration. Keshav and Mindy are married. Keshav is employed and an employment income of 35,000 per annum, 35,500 per annum. Mindy spends a lot of time looking after her two children, but works on a Saturday and has employment income of 6,000. They don't have any other income. Mindy makes an election to transfer the marriage allowance to Keshav. Why does Mindy make an election to transfer to uh, Keshav? Because they have, her income is very less, is less than personal allowance and she'll be saving her, imp her personal allowance will go waste. So to ensure that her personal allowance does not go waste because of her limited income, she tra is transferring her spouse, transferring it to her spouse to reduce the overall tax liability. They've asked us to calculate Keshav and Mindy's income tax liabilities. How do we do? There's only one source of income that is employment income. There are no reliefs involved. So employment income is equal to net income. 35,500 for, for uh, Keshav, 6,000 for Mindy. We'll deduct the personal allowance. Mindy's personal allowance is reduced to 11,310 uh, because uh, she's transferring 1260. But even that is more than her income of 6,000. So still, she still has no income tax liability, right? But for Keshav, the everything else will remain the same. The she he gets a deduction of 12,570. They calculate in, income tax liability at 20 percent. After we calculate the income tax liability, the marriage allowance of that is 20 percent at 1260 is deducted of 252 is deducted from his final income tax liability, which gives us a, his final income tax liability as 4334. This is very important, guys. Marriage allowance is deducted after we calculate the income tax liability of the recipient. Only then we deduct the marriage allowance. So please bear this in mind. It can be, it will, it can be part of an illustration or can be asked as an MCQ. You have to remember this in all time. Coming to income tax payable, income tax payable may be different from income tax liability. As we learned, income tax liability is what the taxpayer is 
due to pay to HMRC after computation. Income tax payable is the final he tax he will be paying directly after deducting any tax already paid on employment. So, in the UK, the UK tax system employs a system called pay as you earn system, where in case of employment, the employers deduct the taxes on the behalf of their employees and submit to HMRC on their behalf. So, only those taxes which are remaining to be paid by the taxpayer after deduction of pay will be paid at the year end by the taxpayer. So, income tax payable at the end of the tax year may be different from the income tax liability calculated on the taxpayer. We can do a quick illustration on this. Vaseem has taxable trading income of 41,870 and gross employment income of 12,250 for the tax year. He does not have any savings or dividend income. So, only non savings income of 41,780 and 12,250. Pay of 80 was deducted from his employment income. Now, so pay of 80 has already been deducted. So his income tax liability will not include, will finally deduct 80 from his final income tax liability to get his income tax payable. Let's do that. Trading plus in employment income is 12,250. Total income is 54,120. We'll deduct the PA. Of 12,570 get the taxable income, we'll use the two, two thresholds of 20-40% and we get total income tax liability. From this income tax liability, we deduct 80 of pay already paid and we get the final income tax payable for the taxpayer. Sufficiently easy topic, let's move to reliefs. As I said, in the beginning when we were discussing the computation guys, relief for to against total income is available. It's available for certain payments made by an individual and trading losses. This is deducted from total income to get net income. And one of the reliefs that is available is on qualifying interest payments. What are qualifying interest payments? In qualifying interest payments are interest paid on those loans which are incurred to on a qualifying purpose. So interest paid on loans incurred to make a qualifying expenditure can be included in the reliefs. What is this qualifying purpose? If a person takes a loan to purchase plant and machinery in the use of their employment, this is a qualifying purchase and interest paid on such a loan will be deducted from his total income. If they take a loan to purchase shares in an, in an employee controlled trading company, if a full time employee takes a loan to purchase shares in an employee controlled trading company, it will be given as a deduction. If they take a loan to, if a partner takes a loan to purchase a share in a partnership, that will also be uh, allowed as qualifying expenditure and interest will be deducted from uh, the total income. The purchase of, uh, if the loan is taken to by a part, partner to purchase plant and machinery for use in the partnership, that will also be deducted from the total income. So there are four kind of qualifying expenditure for which on which interest paid will be deducted from total income. This is include pl plant and machinery by employed person in employment, by an employee for uh, to purchase shares in an employee trading company by the partnership to purchase the share in a partnership and by a partner in a partnership to purchase plant and machinery for that purpose. Relief will be given by simply deducting their that income from total income. Let's do a, a quick illustration on this. Akbar and Misa each have total income of 54,000, none of which is savings or dividend income. So it's only non-savings income. They made the following payments during the tax year. Akbar made interest payments during the tax year, totaling 2,000 on his mortgage for his main private residence. This is not a qualifying purpose, so this will not be allowed. Misa made interest payments of 2,000 on loan to invest in a partner for which she, on, in which she is a partner. This is a qualifying purpose since this is she's taken a loan to purchase a share in a partnership and this will be deducted from her total income. How will that work? We, we know total income is this. We'll just deduct the reliefs. Now, no, there's no such thing, no eligibility for Akbar, but we'll, del we'll deduct it from Misa. 
and we'll reduce the PA and calculate the, the tax rate basis the different thresholds. Coming to charitable giving. Charitable giving is available in two ways. Donations under the gift aid scheme, as we remembered, the any donations made under the gift scheme is deducted from net income to calculate adjusted net income. We'll learn more about this today. Gift aid scheme is when donations are made by individuals to NGOs or to support certain causes. And payroll and tax relief may also be given for payroll giving under the payroll deduction scheme. We'll learn more about this in detail, but you have to understand that there are there may be cases where an employer of a, a of or a company encourages its, its employees to support a do, uh, to a cause by donating a small part of their salary to that cause and this is also available and finally this will be available to them as a tax relief so they get the benefit of doing something good for the country for the society while also getting a tax relief this is known as the payroll deduction scheme and we will learn more about this in detail this is also something on which tax relief is given donations under the gift aid scheme now donations made under the gift aid scheme attract relief at the donor's highest rate of tax they, there's no minimum or maximum amount of relief and it can be done in any way that the taxpayer so pleases the payments are made with basic tax reducted source providing basic tax relief 20% at at the time of payment itself so for instance if an individual wants to pay 100 pounds to a charity they will only pay 80 and the charity will collect 20 from hmrc so and the gross amount that will be treated for tax purposes is 100 so 100 will be deduct 100 will be considered as his gross payment but he will only pay 80 so he gets a benefit of 20% directly right and uh, for higher and additional tax rate payments this is for basic tax payments they get 20 percent uh, on on basic on on at the time of payment for higher and additional tax rates payer that is remembering the thresholds of 40 percent or 45 percent relief comes in two parts they'll obviously get this 20 percent tax relief that is given to basic tax rates payer and they are also get the benefit of adding the gross amount of the donation to the basic rate bands so if 100 pounds if uh, say a taxpayer is has paid has getting a gross amount of 100 pounds to a charity they will only pay 80 that's one but that 100 gross amount will be added to the thresholds we know that the higher rate threshold is 150,000 uh, basic rate th uh, threshold is 37,700 and plus 100 will be added to that threshold. So instead of income taxed at 20% of only till 37,700, it will be taxed at 37,800. Similarly, for higher rate taxpayer, the threshold will increase from 150,000 to 150,100. And the thresholds will change accordingly, increased accordingly as per the gross amount. So imagine the benefit available to the taxpayer for making a gross donation, for making a donation to a charity. They get 20% relief on payment, so they only have to make 80% payment. And on that 100% gross amount, that gross amount is added to the basic and higher rate. So their thresholds will also change as per according to the donation that they make. Let's understand this deeply with the help of an example. So illustration 8 says, Betty has employment income of 55,000 each year. Makes a payment of 3600 uh, 36 to a charity under the gift aid scheme. How would we calculate? Guys, please pay attention. This is very important. Basic rate band is 37,700. Gross gift aid donation that is 36% is 80% of what? It is 80% of 4500. This we get by reversing the equation by this. This is how we calculate 80%. 4500 
4500 3600 is 85 80% of 4500 and this is we will get there by multiplying the 3600 by 100 and dividing it by 80. So, the extended basic rate band will be 42,200. Now, employment income is 55,000, PA is 12,470, taxable income is 42,430 and income tax now will be calculated so, threshold basic rate threshold has increased from 37,700 to 42,200 for basic rate tax. So, 42,200 will be taxed at 20 percent and the remaining that is 230 is taxed at 40 percent and the income tax liability would be the total of this 8532. So, let us recap what happened. He made the payment of 3600 to a charity this will only be considered now but for tax purposes that payment will be considered 4500 so he gets a 20 percent tax relief at the time of payment and this 4500 is added to the basic rate band of 37700 37700 plus 4500 is 4200 so and 42200 for 20 percent will be charged at 20 percent if he hadn't made that if this option was not available, they would have taxed 37,700 at 20% and the remaining at around 5,000 remaining at 40%. So, his income tax liability would have been increased by that much. So, this is uh, very important guys, it is a very important benefit to increase funding for social causes and it is also a very important benefit available to taxpayers. This will be tested to you in the form of a small MCQ or it can be part of a larger uh, computation as well. So, these are concepts that you have to start registering now. Your thresholds increase for by, by gift aid schemes and it is important that you understand that. It is important you practice more and more illustrations in this regard. Coming to child benefit tax charge. Child benefit is a tax prepayment that the government pays to individuals in respect of children. However, an income, a child benefit tax arises where someone receiving the benefit, that is an individual receiving the benefit is either themselves or their partner is, has an adjusted income of 50,000 or more. So, if an individual or their partner or their spouse has an income of 50,000 pounds or more, they will have to pay a a child benefit tax charge. This is done by the government to ensure that child benefit tax, child benefits only goes to the individuals who need it the most and higher income individuals do not get child benefits from the government because they can afford to raise their kids on their own. This scheme is meant for those kids to support those individuals who may not have the income or the means to raise their own children and a child benefit income tax charges arises on if an individual receiving the child benefit themselves or through their partner has an adjusted net income of 50,000 or more. How is it done? Adjusted net income is of course calculated in the same way as we do for personal allowance and the tax charge is as follows. If the adjusted net income calculated is between 50,000 and 60,000, 1 percent of child benefit for each 100 of income over, uh, over 50,000 is uh, levied as tax charge. So, it is important that this 1 percent is levied as is, is understood how we mean by 1 percent. We will just do this in an illustration and if it is if the adjusted income is over 60,000, the entire child benefit received is given back to the government as a tax charge. So, if the income of the individual receiving the benefit or their partner is more than 60,000, they will get no tax they will get no child benefit and the child benefit if they, in case they are receiving will be received will be refunded back to the government through the tax charge. So, again you do not have to remember these tax rates and allowance this is given to you in the ex tax rates and allowance sheet provided to you in the examination. Let us do a quick illustration. Pat and Millie are married with two children. Millie received child benefit of 1828 during the tax year. Pat has no income 
as he looks after the couple's children. Miley is employed with a salary of fifty-four thousand per annum. That is more than fifty thousand. Remember, this is the threshold, and has no other source of income. She paid hundred and eighteen hundred to a registered charity under the gift scheme as well. So remember, there are two concepts, guys. Here, fifty. There, she is getting a there, getting a tax benefit. That is the child benefit, but with a income of more than fifty thousand. So there will be a reduction on that. But they've also paid eighteen hundred to a registered charity under the gift aid scheme. So with they will. Get that benefit of twenty percent tax benefit at the time of payment and addition of gross amount to the thresholds. So let's dive in. Remember, eighteen hundred is set to be the net figure. So you will have to calculate the gross figure by multiplying by hundred and dividing by eighty to get to understand what is eighteen hundred eighty percent off. Right. So employment income for Millie, we have to calculate under the illustration. Employment income is fifty-four thousand. Personal allowance is twelve thousand five hundred and seventy pounds. We get taxable income. Everything is non-savings income, so we get four hundred fourteen seventy. The basic rate band will be extended. Remember, guys, because they have paid. A gross, they have paid to a registered charity under the gift aid scheme. Their basic rate band will be extended. How by how much? One eighteen hundred into hundred by eighty, which is two two five zero. That will be added in their basic threshold, which will now become thirty nine thousand nine fifty. So income earned till thirty nine thousand nine fifty will be charged at twenty percent, and the remaining will be taxed at forty percent. Now this is their uh, tax liability from. Normal income tax, but remember they are also getting child benefit, but their income is more than fifty thousand. So you they will have to pay child benefit tax charge as well. How do we calculate benefit child benefit tax charge? We calculate the adjusted net income. How do we calculate the adjusted net income? We deduct the gross gifted donation from the net income. Remember, guys, gross gifted donation is added to the threshold. It's added to threshold of tax, but deducted for A N I. That is adjusted net income. Remember this principle always, always, always. It's very important. So to get adjusted net income, we divide the gross amount of of gross aid from total income. So adjusted net income is one five seven five fifty one thousand seven fifty, which is And that is one thousand seven fifty in excess of the lower limit of fifty thousand, and we know that one percent of every hundred in excess of fifty thousand will be char charged as child benefit tax charge. So one percent per hundred of one seven five zero. That is seven five zero divided by hundred is seventeen point five percent. We'll round it down to seventeen percent. So child benefit would be seventeen percent of child benefit. child benefit is 1828 so the 17% of child benefit will be reduced will be charged as tax 17% of 1828 is 310 so this will be added in their total tax liability the income tax liability is 8892 i hope you understood this guys there are multi, there were number of concepts here i'll repeat it once again the gross gift aid scheme it's added in your basic and additional rate thresholds there was no additional rate here so it was only added to the basic threshold which gave us 39950 and it is deducted to get adjusted net income basis which we calculated the tax child benefit tax charge then so these are the kind of complexities that you will encounter in 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 the examination so it's important that you understand as many questions as possible in during the sessions and during your preparations but fret not we'll be doing a lot more of these illustrations we'll be doing a lot more of these revision questions in the marathon and we'll be i'll be always available for any doubts you have so don't don't worry just keep going keep practicing and i'm confident that you'll that you'll clear the exam 
moving on to an again a very very important topic guys it's called tax residency of an individual it's very important as we learned at the beginning of the chapter the your the basis of an individual's tax is based on his residency they will be if they are tax resident they will be taxed on their worldwide income so it's important to determine how an income how the tax residency is is assessed right so an individual is tax resident in the uk if they do not meet one of the automatic non residency tax if they meet one of the automatic residence tax or if they meet one of the more sufficient tax tests let's 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 understand this in the form of a procedure the first step to determine residency of a of a person is to check if they are automatically non uk residents there will be certain parameters on checking if there are certain if they if they follow if they fall into any of those parameters they will be non uk tax residents automatically we we'll learn more about these parameters but if they fall one into one of these parameters they are automatically non uk residents if they satisfy even one test they are automatically non uk residents if not then we go to step 2 first we'll check that if they are uk non uk residents or not if they are not then we'll check if they are automatically uk residents similarly they will have there will be multiple tests on to satisfy if an individual is an automatically uk resident if they if they satisfy even one test they will be considered a uk tax resident if not then they will go to step 3 step 3 will determine how many sufficient ties in the U, uh, with the uk does the individual have and how many tax how many days does he spend in the in in the uk so table 3 will determine residency on two factors that is step 3 will be uh, will decide the residency basis on two factors their sufficient ties and number of number of days the, this will be done through tax tables which will be given to you in the examination but remember this will only be used after we exhaust step 1 and step 2 step 1 to determine if it's on non uk residents step 2 to determine if the uk automatically uk residents and only when these two fail which we'll get to will be used employ step 3 let's go deeper into these subjects and these areas so that you understand it better what are the automatic non uk residents tax an individual is automatically non uk resident if he she is in the uk for less than 16 days if they're in the less if they're less than 46 days have and have not been uk resident for any of the previous tax years three tax years and 91 days if they're less than in the uk for 91 days and work full time overseas so there are three automatic non uk residency tax in the step 1 they'll be automatically non uk residents if they are in the uk for less than 16 days if they are uk in the less if they are in the uk for less than 46 days and have not been uk resident in the previous 3 years or if they are in the uk for less than 91 days but work full time overseas in all three cases they will be automatically non uk resident so if they even satisfy one test they are automatically non uk resident so but it's possible that they do not satisfy any the, any of this test so we'll move on to step 2 to determine whether they are automatic residents an individual is automatically uk resident if they're in the uk for at least 83 tax days in the year that is half a year if they're in the uk for more than half a year they will be considered an automatically uk resident they will be considered an automatically uk resident if their only home is in the uk and if they work full time in the uk so they will be considered automatically uk resident basis if they spend more than half a year in the uk and if their only home and place of employment is in the uk now individual is considered in the uk if they are in the uk at midnight now it's possible and it's it happens that an individual is neither non uk resident neither automatically uk resident so to how to determine the residency of an individual in this case we'll go to sufficient ties how many of these sufficient ties and the number of days spent in the uk what are sufficient ties there are five kinds of sufficient ties family ties will be uh, you an individual will be considered to having a family tie with the uk if he has close family that is spouse civil partner or minor children in the uk 
So, if they have spouse, civil partner and minor children in the UK, they will be considered to be having a family tied to the country. If they have an accommodation tie, if they have a house in the UK, which is made use of in the tax year, they will be considered to having an accommodation tie. If they do substantial work in the UK, they will be considered to have a work tie to the UK. If they have spent more than 90 days in the UK, for either of both of the previous two tax years, they will be considered another tie, days in the UK tie. So, in case for F, uh, the last two FYs, they have spent either of the two last FYs, they have spent more than 90 days, they will be considered tied to the UK. And finally, if they spend more time in the UK than any other country, they will be con considered a country tie. It's possible that while they spend less than 90 days or less than 40 days, days in, in, in the UK, but that is still more than they have spent in any other country. So, in that case, they will be considered a UK tie, a, a country tie. So, step 3 will involve the, to assess the number of sufficient ties and after we have assessed the number of ties, they, they, they will, their residency will be determined based on the number of days spent in the UK. So, if and this will be divided based on uh, whether they were previously resident or non-previously resident. So, if what is previously resident, previously resident uh, an individual is considered previously resident if they are UK resident for one or more of the three previous years and non if they are not considered non previously resident if, they're, they, if they were non UK resident for more one or more of the three previous years. So, if they spend less than 16 days in the UK and they are previously resident they will automatically non resident and if they are previously non resident they will automatically non resident if they are less than 16 days. So, in case less than if, if an individual has spent less than 16 days in the UK, they will automatically be considered non-residents despite their number of ties and despite their previous residency. Now, if they are spent between 16 and 45 days in the UK and they have been previously resident, they will be considered resident in the tax year. Let us assume the tax year to be FY23. So, if they spend between 16 to 45 days in the UK in FY23 and they have been previously resident, they will be considered resident in FY23 if they have 4 UK ties of more. So, out of 5 if they are tied to the UK in 4 ways, they will be considered a UK resident for the tax year FY23. If they spend between 16 to 45 days, uh, but they were not previously resident, they will still remain automatically non-resident. Moving on, if they spend 46 to 90 days in tax year FY23 and they have been previously resident, they will be considered resident in FY23 if they have 3 UK ties or more. And if they spend between 46 to 90 days and have, have not been previously resident, they will be considered resident only in FY23 if they have 4 UK ties or more. So, guys, I hope you are getting the gist of the table. It is harder for a previously resident of the UK to re relinquish his citizenship. Let us finish the table. If they spend 91 to 120 days in the tax year and they are previously UK resident, they will be considered a resident if they have two UK ties or more. But if they are previously non -res resident, they will be considered resident if they have three UK ties or more. Similarly, one between if they spend between 121 to 182 days as previously resident, they will be considered resident if they have one UK tie. And if they are not previously resident and they spend 121 to 182 days, they will be considered resident if they have two UK ties or more. We will be doing this in, in we will just be exploring this in detail through an illustration. But remember guys, if 183 days or more they spend in the UK, they will automatically resident at all times. So, the, uh, this table is available to you in the examination, you do not have to worry about it and I know it seems complicated now, but once you start getting into the questions, it will be very easy. So, let us dive in. Illustration 10 wants to explain whether the following individuals are resident in the UK in the tax year 22-23. We will do each example one by one. Dexter was born in Germany, he has lived in his hometown until the tax year 2023. That is, he has been previously non-resident. 
it's important to break down residency questions to help you understand and frame your answer better he has been lived in he has lived in his hometown in germany until the tax year 2023 that making him not previously non resident when he came to the uk on visit on 10th june 2022 until 18 january 2023 so let's remember our test what's the procedure we follow we for we determine whether he is automatically non resident first step he is not automatically non resident because he has spent more than 91 days in the country second step we'll see whether he is automatically resident this is triggered if they have spent more than 183 days now has he yes he has he has spent more than 183 days because 10 june 2022 to 18 june 2023 is 222 days since this is more than 183 days they are autom he is automatically a resident so dexter is automatically a resident in the as per the residency rules coming to point number 2 she was simon was born in france she has lived in her hometown in france until the tax year 2023 when she came to her uk to visit for a month now let's take the first step is she automatically non resident there are three conditions less than 16 days but she's more, been more more than 16 days since she's been in a month less than 46 days and has abroad so she is automatically non resident because she has been in the uk for less than 46 days about a month so that would roughly either 30 or 31 days and she has a home abroad so that is why she is automatically non resident coming to point number 3 freddy has always spent more than 300 days in the uk and has therefore been uk resident so he has previously been UK resident. It's important to break down again. Important to break down residency questions. He's previously resident. He gave up work on fifth April, twenty twenty two. On eighteenth May, he set off around the world on a holiday. He did not return to the UK until sixth April, twenty twenty three. That is end of the year, right? So, how many days did he spend in the UK? He spent fifth April to. 18th may he spent in the uk which is 42 days so what do we know so far he is previously non resident he is previously resident and he has spent 42 days in the uk so to be determined to determine his residency he has to satisfy four ties or more now let's see if he has initially he spent 5 weeks in the second home in portugal but did not spend more than 10 days in any other country while he was away so he has a second home in portugal while his primary home is in uk and did not spend more than 10 days in any other country while he was away he kept in touch with his family and young children who remained in the family home in the uk so what do we know so far he is previously non resident he has spent 42 days in the country and he has to satisfy four ties or more to be considered residents in the, resident in the uk now uh, he has a close family tie because he has kids and spouses in the uk we learned that from the question he has he has accommodation tie to the uk because he made use of a uk house he has days in the uk tie because he has spent more than 90 days in the uk in both of the previous tax year he has spent more than 300 days in the uk in the previous tax year that's written in the question and country try he has spent more time in the uk than any other country the question makes it explicitly clear that they have spent he has spent more than uh, more time in the uk than any other country therefore he is uk resident in 2023 just to recap we knew that he was previously non resident he spent between 16 and 45 days that is 42 days and if we go back to the table if a person is previously non resident and spends between 16 and 45 days he has to meet at least four family ties 
to be judged as a resident in the UK. And since Ferry does, he is resident in the UK. I hope you understood. Coming to point four, Olka. Olka, a housewife, visited the UK on holiday for thirty days in each of the last five years, as not and was not UK resident in those years. So, she was previously non-resident. On April sixth, April twenty-two, she purchased a holiday cottage in the UK. That is at the start of the year. In the tax year twenty-two twenty-three, she visited the UK for eighty days, staying in her UK home. She has a UK home, and from the, apart from the two weeks when she stayed with her seventeen-year-old son who had come to study in the UK. So what do we know so far? She was previously non-resident, and she visited the UK for eighty days. She has a home and a, a son in the UK. So let's apply the three-step principle to see whether she is resident or not. First, whether she is automatically non-resident. She has spent less than eighty days. She has spent. Uh, she has spent more than sixteen uh, days. She has spent more than forty-six days, and while she has spent less than ninety-one days. she doesn't work full time overseas so therefore she is not automatically non resident remember to be automatically non resident one has to spend less than 91 days in the uk and be working full time overseas while she meets one of the condition of spending less than 91 days she doesn't meet the other condition of working overseas that's why she is not automatically non resident step 2 whether she is automatically residents she is not an automatically resident because she has not she is not spe- uh, spend more than 180 days in the uk and she also has a home in in germany so she is not automatically non resident she is not automatically resident we'll have to determine her residency based on sufficient ties and days spent in the uk she has spent between 46 and 90 days she has spent 80 days in the uk and since she was previously non resident she would be needing four ties or more to be considered uk resident she has only two ties she has close family in the uk her son is studying in the uk and she has a house in the uk so only two of the four ties are satisfied that's why she is judged as non resident remember guys please refer to the table again and again because it's important that that it's important that table is available to you in the exam specifically for this purpose the, the examiner wants you to apply the concepts and not learn the table itself so it's important if you if you know that if he has previously previously non residents spend between 16 uh, 46 and 90 days she has to satisfy four ties or more to be resident since she doesn't she is a non resident so guys this is it i hope you understood everything let's do a few quick examples so that you register what you learned today in session Example one: Which of the following interest payments is deductible from total income to arrive at net income? Interest on loan to buy an interest in the partnership. This is correct. This is a clearly a qualifying expenditure as given in the rules. But before dismissing all the other options, make sure you read it to ensure that you are in fact correct. Interest on loan to invest in machinery for a sole trader's business. This is not a qualifying purpose. interest on loan to purchase a uk property to be treated as a furnished holiday recommendation again not a holiday recommendation interest on loan to purchase a foreign holiday home which will not be rented out again not a qualifying purpose lucky and richard have been married for 10 years lucky owns 75% of a rental home and richard owns the other 25 rental income received from the property is 15000 they have not made any elections remember what the the clause that we learned at the beginning of the session we learned that if there is no election made by the spouses or a pa- other partners 
on income from jointly owned asset the income will be divided split 50-50. Here the question makes it clear that they have not made any election while they are getting 15,000 income from a jointly owned asset. Since they have made no election they will be charged at 50% each and taxed at 75 and taxed on 7500 each. Therefore, the correct answer is B. Question number 3. UZ has net income of 109,500 and paid a gift aid donation of 2400 in the tax year 22-23. What is his personal allowance? So, remember gift aid donation is deducted from the net income to calculate adjusted net income. Since net income is more than 100,000, we will calculate the adjusted net income and adjusted net income is calculated by deducting the gross amount of gift aid. While it does not say gross or net, we assume that when the question is silent that this is a net figure, so gross figure has to be calculated. Remember this concept in the exam as well. When the, there is nothing mentioned on gift aid, assume that it is a net figure and you have to calculate the gross figure. So, we will calculate the gross figure as 2500 into 100 by 80 which is 3000. We will deduct the same from the net income and get an adjusted net income of 106,500 which is 6500 more than the uh, threshold of 100,000 and 50% of this will be deducted from the total personal allowance. So, 3,250 will be deducted from the uh, total personal allowance of 12,570 and the net figure 9320 will be the answer. That is the answer C. Option C is the correct answer. Remember guys, this will be an MCQ. So, they want you to apply your concepts. They won't give you give it to you directly. So, you, you might have to make some workings. Uh, you have note down some workings on the site somewhere and if you understand the concepts well, if you if you know how to calculate the gross figures well, you will do it very, very quickly. This is a very scoring area. If you know the concepts, you will you'll answer in a jiffy and you can save valuable time for your long form answers. Last and final example, Pierre was born in France. He has been working full time in the UK and been UK resident for tax purposes in the last five years. Again, remember, break down the residency questions. He has been UK re tax resident for past five years, so he is previously resident. He plans to return to France in the year 22-23. Assuming he has two ties in the UK in 2023, what is the maximum number of days Pierre could spend in the UK without being treated? as UK resident in the tax year 22-23. Now go back to the table guys, he is previously noun resident, he has two ties or more, he is previously resident, he has two ties in the UK. Remember if he has two ties and he spends more than 91 days, 91 days or more, then he will be considered a UK tax resident. Uh, if a previously resident spends more than 91 days in the UK and has two ties or more, he will be considered a resident. So, since he is previously resident and he is uh, he has two ties or more, he has to ensure that he spends less than 91 days to be considered as non-resident, right? So, what is the question asked? What is the maximum number of days that peer could spend in the UK without being treated as UK resident? So. He's pre if he spends 91 days or more, he will be considered as residence. So, the maximum number of days in the UK in the, that he can spend in the UK without being considered resident is 1 less than 91, which is 90 days. That is why the correct answer is B. So, guys, you can expect these kind of complexities in the questions. They will ask you to, they will expect you to understand the concepts and apply the concepts and not just look at the tables and answer the questions. You will be able to know the concepts and practice only, only a lot of practice will help you get there. So, be confident when you go through the exam and I would suggest go through these questions again, go through the illustrations again, go through the examples again without looking at the answers, do it on your own and I am sure. I am confident that you will be able to do this on your own. 
right guys so this is it before we end i want to do a quick revision of all we did in the session today we learned about the basis of assessment of tax the tax year in the uk personal allowance which is the tax free income for all U uk residents assessable persons we learned about how spouses and civil partners are treated as separate individuals and what's the, what are the implications if they own a jointly owned asset we learned about taxable income and the basic pro forma for the income tax computation guys this is very very important this will be the basis of your long form answer remember again i reiterate that there will be a 15 mark question on personal income tax and it will include this computation in all its details we we'll learn the details in future sessions but you have to understand and remember this basic pro forma this is core to understanding individual income tax in the uk and i want you to understand everything we learned that there were three types through sources of income non savings savings and and exempt uh, and dividend income again these are all in all of these sources of income there are subheadings uh, which also represent different types of income we learned about exempt income we learned about payment reliefs uh, uh, from net income we learned about personal allowance how surplus pa is lost how pa cannot be set against capital gains and how pa can be transferred between spouses we learned how to reduce the pa in case the adjusted net income is more than 100000 we learned on income tax liability the different threshold and tax rates we learned the principles of income tax computation and did a few illustrations on the same we learned how to calculate income tax liability basis their the the three thresholds for non savings income we learned about marriage allowance and how to transfer 10% how one spouse can transfer 10% of the personal allowance to their partner it's a very important concept on which we did an illustration as well this will be tested in the exam it's a if you know the questions you will be able to score the two mark mcq so be please be aware there are so many little topics you'll find in tax that there are few small concepts that can add up to make a huge number in the exam so you should know every single concept in taxation guys every single small concept needs to be practiced by all students we learned about the pay system in the uk that is pay as you earn system that used for deducting taxes by the employers we learned about the qualifying interest payments that can be deducted from total income to provide ta tax reliefs for the comp for the individual again all of these concepts were practiced with the help of illustrations we learned about the gift aid scheme you guys remember gift aid scheme we added in the thresholds for basic and higher aid and deducted from adjusted net income this is the basic principle that you have to understand for gift aid and remember it at all times this should be in internal to you by now by the time you go to your exam this should be core to you nobody can make you forget this this is a very important topic <coughs> we again did a few examples on this we understood instances where child benefit tax charge will be levied on individuals and again did an illustration on this finally we also learned about the tax residency system of an individual and the three step procedure for determining residence and most importantly the third step where sufficient ties and number of days in the uk are used to assess the tax the residency of an individual remember guys this table is available in the examination to you so you don't have to worry about remembering the table just make sure you understand the concept we also did a few illustrations to determine tax residency i want you to prepare these illustrations on your own without looking at the answers make sure you do that we also did a few examples again i want you to do all the examples on your own without looking at the answers guys please i'm confident that you will be able to i'm here for any doubts you have but i want you to practice on your own without looking at the answers so this this was it guys we'll meet in session 3 till then It's ACC Tarush Jain signing off.